Welcome to Voice Rising with Cara Johnstad. Enjoy weekly conversations with leading luminaries, pioneering visionaries, singers, poets, musicians, and sound healers as we explore the profound role our voice plays on the path to self-realization and global enlightenment. The internationally acclaimed singer, composer, author, healer, recording artist, voice expert, creator of Voice Your Essence, and founder of the School of Voice, Kara Johnstad uses her extraordinary spiritual gifts to empower others. Everything in this world vibrates. Everything has a frequency. A pioneer in the field of voice work and transformational songwriting. Her breakthrough methods are helping thousands of people worldwide fine-tune their body-mind-spirit system and unlock the energetic frequencies of limitless creativity, health, and abundance. Share your voice. Ask your questions. Join in the conversation. Receive life-changing, positive transformation and rise together to create a sound world. And here's your host, Kara Johnstad. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Voice Rising. Today I am with the composer and pianist Ed Basil, and we are talking about not only his new album, which is entitled The London Sessions, Reflections from Studio Two, but we're also talking about the voice of the piano and the beauty of the piano and the healing benefits that we have when we listen to good, soothing piano music. So I welcome you, Ed, to Voice Rising. Cara, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really honored to be here with you. Yes, you have a new album out there, The London Sessions. And it was recorded at Abbey Studios, which is considered holy ground in the recording industry. And you could have recorded anywhere in the world. You were many years in Los Angeles, and you are based in Nashville, which is really the center of music. So there are great studios everywhere, but something led you to record at the Abbey Road Studio, studio number two. So tell us about that dream. Tell us about your journey. I will, well, thank you for asking. You know, I've been a, I started piano when I was five years old because my older sister was taking lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and then I noticed probably around age five, my sister was excited about somebody called the Beatles that were going to be on television on a Sunday night. And uh, I do recall being there with my parents and my sister in our living room. And on a Sunday night, it was the Ed Sullivan show but way back when. Mm -hmm. And I saw these four British guys just it just impact the world and just <laughs> start a, a, an amazing uh, legacy of music. And uh, that music has, you know, been with me ever since. Um, you know, it's been, you know, my sister, we had it playing at our house. My dad would play it. He played Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, Carol King. The, the Beatles were always a part of it. And um, so, you know, with that, I, um, I it became a family. It went very deep with me. I'll put it that way to select Studio 2, Abbey Road Studio 2, that's specifically where the Beatles recorded their hits. And not only that, if you are in Studio 2, it's about the size of a basketball court. It's, mm -hmm. it's large and tall. And uh, the Beatles would always set up in the back left corner, and that's where they set up that Steinway Grand nine-foot concert piano with yeah. 13 microphones. So to, to be on that, as you said, holy grand, ground, it was holy ground, and I was on the exact footprint they were. And to be, uh, you know, I had made sure the lights were low, I'm there with that piano, and uh, it's nice and comforting and soothing dark. And everyone else is upstairs on the opposite end of the basketball court uh, mm -hmm. on the second floor behind, you know, uh, closed doors. So I found myself literally just playing and then recording songs in that beautiful space all by myself. And it, I was thinking, how did I get here? This is profound to be in the same air as all these greats. And um, 
it was not lost on me, Tara. Uh, we we had two ten hour sessions and uh, recorded, you know, like twenty one tracks total. And uh, at the end of the session, session two, everyone else is upstairs. I'm finished. I stand up from the piano and I go back to the back wall where I was. I put my hands on the wall and I started tearing up. Mm. It was that profound. And then one other thing I, I want to make sure to mention is although my parents drug me kicking and screaming to piano lessons for 11 years and I hated it. It was the absolute best gift they ever gave me. And at that recording studio, my dad has been uh, passed away 20 years ago from leukemia. I made sure to wear his cufflinks while I recorded. So they could be a part of it. Yeah. So, so there was something, not just the Beatles, but uh, not in addition to the Beatles, but, it, it was a deeply a family, touching my family and my roots that uh, made that so profound to have my music, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it sink into the walls of, of such greats yeah, at that studio. <laughs> Sorry, you said something very beautiful, and I think most people don't realize it, that, you know, there's only a limited amount of air in this world, so we are literally... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I swallowed my tea a little bit backwards. We are literally breathing in um, the same air that the Beatles at at some point also made music with. <clears throat> my apologies. Um, you ended up not only doing your own compositions, but you did choose two Beatle compositions to do to Beatle mm-hmm. tunes and I would love our listening audience to get a taste of your playing of your style and one of the tracks you chose and I think a little bit of your this family um, connection you decided on my life and yesterday it was the second you know yesterday right, right? Mm-hmm. but my life what what made you choose that song it uh, in my life is such a beautiful, simple yet elegant and profound piece. I hate to keep using the words profound again, but it somehow touches me deeply at my soul level um, to have that and to play it. And I have, prior to coming to Abbey Road, I wanted to make sure I showed up the best version of myself possible. So I must have played that, you know, a thousand times. And just, mm-hmm. I still play it to this day because I love it. And there are so many people that pass through your life, you know, and, uh, you know, I can't thank them all. And, you know, I've loved, you know, been loved mm-hmm. by so many, so many. So it, it makes this, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big, strong six foot two, 215 pound man, you know, but it brings me to tears, uh, with that. So I just that is love that, that is what is so that is what is so precious about music, right? That it's universal, mm-hmm. that you can mm-hmm. record. It doesn't matter. You could be in London or Tokyo or L.A. or Rio, and you mm-hmm. could bring that music. And I always say that you know about music. Let, let's say the, you know the Beatles too. Or it doesn't matter. You you sing in the middle of nowhere to complete strangers. Da de de, da da da, and everybody can sing with you, right? Everybody yeah. knows. Everybody knows. Uh, I don't know. But da de da, everybody knows it. Uh-huh. Everybody knows mm-hmm. it. And that is this amazing thing about how music connects us throughout generations, throughout centuries. It is always yeah. there, guiding us. I, I just that is for me profound, prolific, and mind-blowing how even before the internet, you know, there were tunes, it it doesn't matter from summertime to, you know, who knows what, where people would just Mm -hmm. start the first bar and people would start to sing. And it's just, it's mind-blowing, right? So let's listen, let's, let's listen to music in my life. Let's, let's give it a listen. And this is off of your new album. These are coming from the London sessions that you did at Abbey Road. 
Thank you, Carl. been listening to music in my life and I'm here with Ed Basil I love the lyrics there are places I'll remember all my life though some have changed some forever not for better some have gone and some remain and like you said I, I definitely think that this place you'll always remember these sessions that you did at Abbey Road Studios mm-hmm. studio number two right so do you have a do you follow a process or a ritual before you begin to record? Do you do you suffer from any kind of nervousness or anxiety? You've been doing this for years. You might just be able to to walk in, sit down, and and uh, not get nervous. But normally, it does take a little bit of listening in to the walls, to the piano, to the room, like you said. So, do you have a ritual that you use when you're recording? Well, that's a very good an astute question also. Um, when I record, you know, I was a player out for a living for like 15 to 20 years uh, mm-hmm. professionally. And uh, so I could play in front of anyone as long as they had a cocktail and were talking to other people. So, mm-hmm. uh, that was easy. Uh, now, that when I recorded my first CD here in Nashville, 
I went into the studio and I was, I call it my scared pianist CD because I was so worried about what other people would think and am I good enough and my self doubts, you know, crept in. And, um, and I, you know, I compare that to my process for Abbey Road. I feel, you know, I, I, I practiced two, two hour sessions a day for six months because I wanted to show up the best version of myself and my family for this particular event. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also know I probably played the piano at least 10,000 hours. No kidding. Um, That I wanted to walk in fearlessly. And when I walked into that upper room, you'd walk into the control room first of studio two, then out the door and down those fabled steps that lead down to the studio. As soon as I opened the door to the steps and saw the room, I could tell you there was just a vibration is the best way I can describe it of energy of just profound energy. And I keep using that word again and I felt at home and I honestly felt so prepared and fearless with this session. It was it was a thing of beauty for me to get past that. Oh, what will other people think? Oh my gosh, I'm in a heavy road. Am I good enough? All that didn't matter. It just didn't matter at that point. And it was just heaven is the best, best way I can describe it. It does sound so guided the process. And I think anybody who's lived the life in theater or in studios, you do feel it has a certain soul, right? Every stage, mm-hmm. I think that wood just absorbs it. And every, that Steinway Grand has been touched by so many fingers and hands mm-hmm. and been taken care of by mm-hmm. so many tuners and builders. And, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's stunning. Ed, we're going to take a very short break and then we're going to be back with more Great. diving into the music. The cutting edge of conscious radio. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at ohmtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. With happy clients all over the world, Kara Johnstad knows that your voice is the missing link to more authenticity, abundance, creativity, and health. An internationally acclaimed voice expert, Kara's breakthrough methods have helped thousands of people successfully heal their voice wounds and extinguish the story of self-doubt and shyness forever. Join in group trainings, attend online sessions, schedule one-on-one time, and invite Kara to work with your organization and community. Get started today. Go to www.karajohnstad.com and receive a special guided meditation designed to fine-tune your inner voice and welcome you on the voice journey. This is Kathy Beal, host of Celestial Compass, featuring astrology you can use. Celestial Compass points you to what's going on in the sky and what you can do with it down here on Earth. We also explore fun, effective, and cosmic tools for navigating this adventure we call life. Join me the first and third Monday of the month at 5 p.m. Eastern Time for Celestial Compass. It's enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. If I could be you. And you could be me for just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes.
Welcome back to Voice Rising. With me today is the pianist and the composer Ed Basil. And we're talking about his new album, The London Sessions, Reflections from Studio Two. And we're also talking about the beauty of the piano and something that I think not everybody knows out there. It's called The Art of Piano Voicing. This show is all about, of course, my passion for voice. Um, Ed, as you know, there are there are basically three types of, when we say the art of piano voicing, right? Most jazz musicians refers to how the, the chords are laid or voiced at the piano, mm-hmm. right? How you spread them out. And then the second thing that oftentimes it's like, how do I voice so that the melody really shines? How do I, how do I, how do I lay out and support? We're very important for your type of music where the melody of the piano is exposed or for somebody like me as a singer, you can really tell if the pianist has some kind of an idea about voicing or if he's just playing the chords and we're kind of, <laughs> you know, we don't have keys. So it's nice when he lays those chords out so that we can pick up the melody. But the third type is what I want to talk about. And that is that, you know, this idea that we can literally, these these instruments, not not the keyboards, but the instruments, they're made from felt and wood and, mm-hmm. and metal. And every piano is going to sound differently. There are really masters that come in and balance tones they they can make a piano sound more brilliant make a piano mm-hmm. sound warmer right make a mm-hmm. piano sound more balanced i mean so the piano mm-hmm. has a voice similar to a human being and now where i want to where i want to take this is that what i find phenomenal about a you know your profession my profession is as a singer i know my voice and i have to deal with the microphone sound but you mm-hmm. walk into the theater or the hotel bar yeah. or the event mm-hmm. location, and you're not going to be right. carrying your grand piano on your back. No, no, mm-hmm. Normally you're not, unless it's an electric right. digital grand, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to really be comfortable getting to know in a very short time the sounds, the voices of different instruments because to to the normal person they think it's just a grand piano right i mean what could go wrong but what excites you what kind of sound excites you and do you have a story where you walked in and the piano was not balanced or was out of tune and it was the biggest struggle for you to create great music voicing cara that's a great question that really is you know uh, the selection of a piano for this project was life and death it was my breath you know it was breathing right um so the good news is when you're going to abbey road the the engineers were great in studio two they have both the yamaha nine foot concert grand and a steinway d nine foot concert grand Mm -hmm. my love of music and this project is for a rich beautiful warm tone i I do want to say one thing, Carl. I am not in any way a performer. I really am not. I am, I'm firmly in the lane of instrumentalist. My joy in life is pulling beauty, warmth, rich tones, melody and emotion out Mm -hmm. of that wood and felt uh, piano. So with here at, at, at Abbey Road, where when I was there, um, I, you know, a Yamaha or a Steinway are, are going to be fine. Steinways are more temperamental at times, but they have a rich tone. Yamahas, they're, they're beautiful. They're standard. You always know where a Yamaha is. Here in Nashville, a Yamaha C7 uh, concert grand is the standard for recording studios because the touch and feel are always the same. You're, they're very mm-hmm. consistent. I also, in my dining room furniture is a Yamaha C7 concert grand piano. Oh, wow, nice. So, See, I have yeah. a Steinway grand that I'm looking at in the moment. So I'm looking at a nice. Steinway. You're looking at a Yamaha. Very good. Very good. Yeah. 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 But for this one, I was the, the, the engineers were totally pro at, at Abbey Road, and they sent me audio samples. So I chose the Steinway for the warmth and beauty of this project. 
my you know my originals are romantic, thoughtful, melodic, and sometimes haunting. So, and the Yamaha was a bit tuned more brighter for more pop sessions. So yeah, and you also had a choice. cellist, right? You you have the warm mm -hmm. tones of the cello on your album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, actually, yeah. what we did, we ended up coming back to Nashville, and I had a wonderful guy. He's, you know, just uh, that he composed those pieces for cello and violin, which I love that they just like with you and your voice and a pianist here with a cello and violin that they support the melody not interfere with it you know and not inter you know and not mess anything up just support and i thought they did a wonderful job so i was thrilled with that and they did and uh yeah so the the piano itself the steinway was beautiful just standard touch and feel all the way across and yes i'm very concerned you know with that and i've been at Throughout my years of playing, I played some wonderful pianos in there. Some when you show up and you have to play what's there, and I played <laughs> pianos with missing keys. <laughs> well, that is a story of Keith Jarrett's uh, Cologne concert that the piano just had keys that were not working. And that's mm -hmm. why we have that concert, but he was able to work around it. I wouldn't be able to. You know, remember if you're whatever playing, you know, <laughs> F sharp and, and then suddenly the F sharp doesn't work. You know, again, how can you master the voicings to wow. pull things Good out? Point. That, you know, that is pretty amazing. So I want to play now, I believe it's your own composition. The composition is called Soaring. Oh, you know, we're mm -hmm. flying. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to share something about this piece of. Yeah, this, this piece that's that. on your new album. Thank you for playing this one. This one's in the key of A flat, which I think is a warm key. Mm -hmm. And it also, I envision, I picture, uh, you know, a beautiful bird in the mountains just soaring on the uplifted currents and just experiencing the now, not worrying about the past, worrying about the future, just being there and just gliding along. So I'm. thank you for playing this. Beautiful. Let's listen to Soaring off of the new album.
You've been listening to the track Soaring off of Ed Basil's newest album. He's with us here in studio. Ed, you spent your first 20 years as a solo pianist and at celebrity venues around the world. You also shared a little bit earlier that, you know, if somebody had a wine glass or a cocktail in their hand, you were you were that kind of sound that brought the room together, right? Anybody who's been in, in events like this, we know how important it is to make people feel relaxed. It has a lot to do with the music that's happening in those rooms and that the people I, are not yeah. in the spotlight, right? I agree. I, I call this, I don't, this might be a crude thing to say, but I call it social lubrication. It really yeah. helped yeah. relax the room. And uh, it was as a wonderful way to make a living, oh my gosh, with my hands and my soul. Um, you know, I used to be the pianist at the Ritz-Carlton, uh, the, the Beverly Hills Country Club, all these wonderful places playing. And it's a, it was a dying art, though. They, it's not there anymore. I, I, mm. I go back. I went to the Ritz-Carlton in Laguna de Gale. I found that beautiful Steinway stuck downstairs in the corner in the catering mm. room. You know, with a lock on it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, another one. I, yeah, that's where I find those pianos. But it was again at the time a wonderful way to make a living, and I'm playing all the great, like, someone to watch over me, Moonlight in Vermont, Over the Rainbow, and oh right. gosh, I still play He's... those to this day at night. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful compositions and. Yeah, I, I think it is sad. I, I also remember being in New York in cozy little places listening to a singer and a pianist do torch songs mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. just, just allowing our hearts to, giving space to our heart in, in a world mm -hmm. that wasn't as stressful. But that brings me yeah. that in, two, in 2019, only a couple of years ago, it must have been right at the, it must have been right at the brink of COVID. I don't know if it had already started the, the madness with all the lockdowns, if it was before that, but you had a great desire to help people find peace in this chaotic world, which is which also has a lot of beauty, I want to say, because I don't really want everybody mm -hmm. to just think that everything is a mess. We do have a lot of beauty that's happening. Like you said, there are birds still soaring over the, mm -hmm. the mountains. There are people still, you know, kissing and loving each other and listening to good music. Mm -hmm. But you started an online music channel called The River of Calm, music to soothe your soul. So what, what brought you to that point? Was it so that you had a platform for your music and all your friends? Or, or what was your vision behind this beautiful channel, The River of Calm I wish channel? I, Cara, I wish I was smart enough to have that big of a vision. You know, but I, got, I have mm -hmm. to tell you, at the time, you know, I, from transitioning from a pianist, I went into becoming an agent uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and worked with Judy Collins, Tom McLean, Gordon Lightfoot. I opened my own company. We produced concerts for corporations. I've had an amazing run. But running a concert industry business, which I did for successfully for many years, I found it stressful. Uh, at mm -hmm. night, you know, uh, in the, all the messages and the social media starting. But the more I would sit at the piano at night and play someone to watch over me, Moonlight in Vermont, all those great old, mm -hmm. the more calm and peaceful I would get. And I thought, you know, I could probably create an online station and at least get my CD and my friend Eric, Eric Bicalis, who's a wonderful pianist. He's Neil Sadaka's pianist for 35 years. Uh, Beautiful. I started out with us, and I put those songs up there not to cure the world, not for exposure, but to calm me and my mm -hmm. soul down. And it started there. And um, I found out that with just the two of us, we had like five listeners, and I thought, that's perfect. That's all we need, all, all I need. And I had it on in my house and in my office. And then it's grown now to, we have like 227 independent artists. We have listeners in 166 countries. Uh, yeah. And it's it, it's developed to music and we, we, we feature articles on music and health, music and healing, music and Alzheimer's, PTSD, cancer, etc. Music to me is a healing force. Uh, it might not be a medically recognized scientific 
you know, I don't know the science behind it. I know it calms me, and I know it calms a lot of listeners that also must be searching for something to keep themselves. Centered. Well, you'd be you'd be surprised. There is a science behind it, which is fantastic. And in places like you were in London recording in England, they are now prescribing music lessons for depression. So that you mm. literally, the doctors are saying. You know, here is a prescription and you go get yourself some music lessons because they know that music wow. is uplifting. So it's a, it's a very powerful mm -hmm. uh, what's happening. Also, music medicine or sound healing, um, it's it's being now documented what many of the ancient, you know, monks and, and nuns and churches that everybody knew singing beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, uh, chorales or Gregorian chants, it is being now documented that people have, you know, better sleep, that they're happier. This social lubrication that you said, you know, when people go and sing together, it's when, or when people mm -hmm. listen to music and dance, that also uh -huh. shifts, right? And I think a lot, of, a lot of piano is also being used for people that are studying, and they just, it's hard for them to be in silence, we have so much media and social media and phones that I think to say totally unplug is an illusion. They need a bridge, mm -hmm. and that bridge is great when it's an acoustic piano playing because it calms them and it creates harmony and balance. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. and they can they can come to that place of more quiet, yeah, be, this quietude. Amen. Amen. I, I often We're, say. Yeah, that music transcends language and touches our souls. It really does. Um, and I'm just proud to be lucky enough to play in this arena of life, of music, and, yeah. you know, and healing others. I often said in the concert industry that we, uh, we suspend reality when we have a, you know, a concert for you know, a big corporation, when uh, the Temptations are playing or, you know, the are a foreigner or a bad company and people are up there just watching and they're forgetting about reality. They're suspending that to have that moment of joy. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I'm just a total advocate of music. Yeah. Or, or the Nobel prize this year went to a scientist who was talking about entanglement. So maybe we're suspending reality or maybe we simply have many different realities happening at the same time, but that's a deeper conversation. We're going to take a very short break. And then we'll be back for a little bit more of Ed Basil's beautiful album. Bringing a more conscious lifestyle to your world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Om Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. You came across someone struggling with hunger. How would you recognize them? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September? Or a war veteran who's having, having a hard time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet? I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. I am hunger in America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Voice Rising with me today in studio is the pianist and the composer, Ed Basil. And we're talking about his new album, but we're also talking about the healing power of music, which is very important, I believe, to both of us. 
And Ed, last week you were awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from Miller Piano Specialists. It's the only authorized dealer of Yamaha pianos in Middle Tennessee. So that's a that's a that's nice. Uh, my sister was actually born in Tennessee, so it's a little bit like home. Nice, um, nice. You do your practicing on a Yamaha. You said that it's part of your mm-hmm. dining room furniture. One Mm -hmm. of the reasons that you got this award, I believe, is for the work that you do in, yeah, in in these social aspects or healing aspects, right? You have, for example, provided headphones uh, with healing music, and maybe it was only your music, maybe it was music from the your channel. Right? Mm-hmm. To people that were going through chemotherapy. And you were talking in the beginning of the show that your dad passed from leukemia 20 years mm-hmm. ago. So mm-hmm. what did what yeah. did you experience, not only for yourself, the healing power of music, which you just talked about before the break, but when you put the headphones on someone who's going through chemo, or when maybe you were able to play for your father before he left this world? How did that uh, impact you? Well, two things. From my father, I couldn't cure him when he had leukemia. So I organized a fundraiser for a, a hospital, or a cancer research facility called the, the City of Hope in California. Mm-hmm. And I did it where I rode a bicycle with my one of my great friends from the end of the Santa Monica Pier in California to the end of the St. John's Pier in uh, St. Augustine, Florida, to raise money for the city of Hope. Wow. So that was eight states, 278 cities and towns, and 3,000 miles. So that, I was proud, happy to do that. That was a good thing. Well, mm-hmm. you know, for Dad, he's been gone. But, you know, cancer has been a part of my family history. My dad had leukemia. My mom died from breast cancer. My sister died from breast cancer. Wow. So I'm doing all I can. Now, I once saw... I know I have the river of calm. I, I realized the value of, and I love helping independent artists too, by the way. Mm-hmm. I've worked with mm-hmm. major concert acts throughout the years. I get such joy out of seeing independent solo artists play on our live stream concerts that we have on Facebook. You know, so I'm thrilled to do that. But I once saw a documentary that won the Sundance Film Festival here in the States and it's called Alive Inside. And it's the story where they followed a New York physician who worked with dementia patients. Mm-hmm. And he would put headphones on the dementia patients who were shut down with music from their school years, their high mm-hmm. school years. Mm-hmm. And the, the beauty of watching them wake up was stunning to me. Uh, yeah. I was just, I was stunned by that. So. I connected with uh, Alive Inside, the executive director, and I said, how about um, we, uh, Michael, his name is Michael uh, Rosado Bennett, and um, I said, Michael, how about we use your proprietary headphones, which you now have, um, and we partner them with the music with from the River of Calm independent artists, and we'll find a chemotherapy center here to to start this process with. So we did. Um, it's not my, it's not, I am a, on the river of calm. It's a very favored nations. Everyone is a star, you know, yeah. it's not for me. It's about other people. And I just happen to be involved on it. So um, we have like a, like a true, a, I was going to say like a true river is right. With all the tributaries mm-hmm. and the arms. I mean, that is, yeah. that is very much how a, how a river is made. It's not made with mm-hmm. one river flowing. I mean, there's all these little creeks and brooks that Absolutely. kind of flow into to make that big uh, river, that big, strong river Absolutely. that's going to move towards the ocean. And I do want to yeah. put an, an analogy in there also. When it comes to, you know, we have numerous pianists, and, you know, that come and do our, like we'll have a Christmas concert uh, on the 15th, That'll be live stream for the River of Calm. And we'll have six to ten pianists come. And that you're thinking, oh, my gosh, how am I going to play? But I finally realized, Cara, that, you know, we're all uh, musicians. We're all different 
flavors of ice cream. You know, right. the, yeah. It's not you have to be just one and, and compete, but just be yourself. And I think that's where I am at, at this point in life. So back to Alive Inside. OK, so we partnered. Uh, one of our pianists had breast cancer in, in the local hospital here. So we went to that chemotherapy center and, and developed a pilot project there um, where we have the, you know, not everyone in chemotherapy will want to listen, but some will. And I think, and I firmly believe, Cara, that is the highest and best use of our music and self as musicians is helping others during such a surreal time in their life. Yeah, so, so I'm really proud of that. I agree. You also were, uh, I believe it's a stage of hope, is that correct? The Vanderbilt Sense Theater that you worked mm -hmm. with uh, adults and children, mm -hmm. autistic. I, what I found fascinating is that it also says on your press kit that you're helping them find their singing voice. Now that got my ears all perked up. So oh, is it, yes. how, how is how do you do that? Well, a friend of mine, uh, she's a neuroscientist at Vanderbilt, and uh, she developed a, a thing called Sense Theater, which is Stage of Hope for Children with Autism. So mm -hmm. she would write the plays for them and it would partner a typically developing child in the lead role with a child on the autism spectrum. So they, the child was on the spectrum, we could watch, you know, and model after the typically developing, you know, partner they have. Yeah. So yeah. she would write the lyrics. I would write the melodies. And I, it was so great to see these kids singing a simple song like I'm weird and I'm wonderful. Mm, <laughs> it's just, yeah. uh, it's just, that was so that was just so fulfilling to do so. That's, you know, one of the things we've done, uh, you know, I, I, anyway, so I'm just lucky to be able to help others through this. Beautiful. I want to want to share one last song with our um, listeners. And you created a song, Morning Glory. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any special story you'd like to say or should we just dive I right love in? Starting, I love starting off with a bright song to wake up the morning so uh, have at it there thank you so much okay let's listen into morning glory off of ed's new album
A beautiful way to start every day, Morning Glory by Ed oh. Baisley. He's sitting here with me. Ed, mm -hmm. you said, you have said many times that I find, um, I, I find it amazing, 11 years, that you are really kicking and screaming uh, not to go to mm -hmm. piano lessons. And at the same mm -hmm. time, you do have an amazing gratitude and gratefulness for the gift that was given to you. And I'm sure at some point there was a turning point, and I'm, I'm hoping that the teachers have changed so that, that we're not forcing our kids to study music, but that that the kids have different methods now that they that they go there happy mm -hmm. right but that being mm -hmm. said you've been in music doing music whether you're kicking and screaming or relaxing or have the lights down low for decades and what is what is a golden nugget that you'd like to share as we come to the close of the show about having a music practice or even having a music listening practice what what are what what is a golden nugget that we we can take with us and maybe integrate into our our mornings to make this life a little bit more glorious well that's a great question uh you know i do want to say real quickly on my parents forcing me i thought it was just my mom's clever way since my sister older sister was taking lessons for a half hour that she dropped me off also for a half hour, so she'd have an half, half, or she'd have a full hour up to herself without kids. Mm, so, yeah. And then, and then, fast forward, I made sure that my parents knew that was the best gift they ever gave me. I remember playing in my dad's nursing home. Uh, we yeah. uh, wheeled him down to the dining room with my mom, and I played. And then I stood up, and there were people in there dining. I said, "I'm." Oh, I want to thank my parents. They're responsible for me having this wonderful gift. And I literally, I'm not kidding you, Cara, at the end of the night, I the lights are off. There's a street light shining in my window. And I play, and I play those songs that you hear, and, the, and the, you know, every single night. And it's like my communion. And I, at the end of the night, I lift my arms up, and I, to the heavens, I I, I'm not joking. I can just feel a connection, and I say, thank you, God, and hello, Mom and Dad and my sister, and just thank you for yeah. the influence you've given me. So yeah. um, uh, I just say uh, music, it, it, it's a vital, uh, vitally important in our world. I don't know how. I'm just operating on a drive and a feel, and I'm just so lucky to be here, to be with you today on this. Yeah, beautifully said. Ed Basil, you can get his work, I think, everywhere, online streaming, your favorite mm -hmm. streaming platform, but it's edbasil.com, and that is E-D-B-A-Z-E-L, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very funny. In, in Germany, basil is basilicum, is, is, no, basil, that's in English too, right? But it's spelled differently. B-A-Z-E-L. That's a very good mm -hmm. healing plant, right? Um, I go. thank you so much. I, I wish you Aww. much success for this amazing thank new you. album, The London Sessions. I'm so happy that you followed that calling and that you followed your dreams and you made a dream come true for yourself. That, that is ins Thanks. inspiring by itself. Yeah. Thank you also, Cara, for all that you're doing, too. I really appreciate this. Thank you. You have a good one. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye.